Welcome back to the third and final part looking at the DeWalt DWE 7485 compact table saw. Today we're going to put it through its paces in a typical project that's going to show up its strengths and its weaknesses. That sounds good. Stick around. One of the reasons I wanted the small compact saw is to obviously make small compact cuts, both rip cuts and cross cuts. Although my cross cut saw works incredibly well, the track saw system, I just wanted a table saw, a little bit quicker to set up, a little bit quicker to use, long rips and cross cuts. And I've got a commission in the workshop for quite a large cutting board, 300 millimeters wide, 400 millimeters long, round about 45 to 50 millimeters thick, depending how well my stock turns out. I've already gone ahead and I've sorted out my stock. I've used a planer jointer and I've got a nice big chunk of cherry and three big chunks of um, hard maple. So it's a great test for the table saw. Long rip cuts coming up, 1.3 meter length. Will they come out parallel? Will they come out nice and tidy? We'll then join the board to make the long grain board and then I cross cut that board to make the final 50 millimeter thick board. Cross cuts, rip cuts, interesting stock. Let's see how we get on with that. Before we make the cuts, I just want to show you the setup I've got going on now with the table saw. I've not taken it away from out of the box configuration yet. I will be doing at some point as I build a cabinet and pimp this thing a little bit. So let me quickly show you the setup we've got and then we'll crack on and get the job done. So here we go then. I just knocked up a very, very quick and simple table just to give this something to sit on. I've got this slightly above my top, my, my workbench, and I'm going to be using the workbench as an outfeed table. And I'm just using this simple roller stand here uh, as my infeed table. So that gives me the right basic setup that I want to use. You can see I've got the top guard on and I've got dust extraction here at the top. And this simply connects to a hose here, a hose on the back 100 millimeter port and comes down to a Y connector here that then just goes into the Festool vac. So that's what we're using for dust collection. Now obviously the Festool vac is a great little unit. I think I've reviewed that in the past, can't quite remember. Um, so that will really give this a fair crack at the whip to see how good the dust is. I'm using the stock fence that came with the machine. No modifications to that at all. I've got it locked into place and I've got it set as a distance of cut of 32 millimeters. For the rip cut, I'm using the factory fitted blade, the one that came with it. But for the cross cut, I have picked up an aftermarket blade from Keyblade and Fixins. I've used their blades most of my machines and it's really, really good. This is a 210 blade, uh, 2.4 curve and 52 teeth on the blade. So that should give me quite a fine cut when I eventually get down to those cross cuts. Job one is I want to rip all the stock down to 32 millimeter strips. I should end up with a shed load of 32 by 20 millimeter strips, all looking pretty much the same, if this thing is any good. Ideally, I don't want to see a lot of dust around here. A few of you fed back about the way that I did the actual noise calibration, because I rested the noise meter on the bench, and quite rightly, a few said it's picking up mechanical noise, and it's airborne noise that you're interested in. So what I'm going to do, just somewhere away out of sight, I'll just get the, the um, noise meter running in the background, just taking a reading, and then we'll look at the mean reading once we've got the cuts done and see what we think of that. Okay, so I've got the decibel meter, we'll just get that going here, reset, and we'll get that going. I'm just gonna put it here, um, up on the wall, so it's not resting on the bench, so there's no vibration, up on the wall, and we'll see how we get on. I'll just leave that running in the background, and then we'll look at an average shortly. So for the stock, I've planed both sides so they're nice and flat and smooth and I've just created one reference edge that squares to the face. The other edge is still rough cut. I didn't bother doing this edge because obviously it's going to be on the waist side of the wood. So I've got a nice edge to run down the fence and everything's nice and flat. Guards are all in place, dust extraction's on, safety gear ready to go. Let's get the job done. Now that was super, super easy. That's a cherry all ripped, and it's all come out exactly the same size, which is what you want, of course. And if I hold that together in my hands, you can see, you can start to see that's made a really nice cut. Super pleased with that. So if I just look at the decibel readings, 
came out at an average of 75.8 decibels. It peaked at 93.2. So overall, that wasn't too bad. That was slightly better than the other day when I just rested the, the device on the top, which is obviously what, what you guys are saying to me, and that's perfectly true. So that's not too bad, I don't think. Now, the dust collection is so much better. I'm not seeing any dust on the bench at all. Small amount on here. Quite a lot down the side here. Not stupid amounts, but quite a lot down the side there. So overall, the dust collection is, is better than I thought it was going to be. It's pretty average. Now, don't forget, when I talk about the dust, that is talking about the larger particles that the vac is not picking up. In terms of the dust in the air, I kept an eye on my air quality meter here. And it peaked at around about 30 parts per million, a 2 micron was the measurements around that, the dust particle size. And that's well within safety tolerances. So overall, initial results cutting the cherry, not too shabby, not too shabby at all. Now I'm going to crack on and I'm going to cut through the maple and see how we get on with that. Cherry's quite soft, maple's a lot harder of course. Now, as you'd expect, the maple was much harder than the cherry, but the machine coped okay. I could feel the tension in the wood, and I do think without this rather excellent driving knife fitted, that would have been kicking back on me. I could feel, let's say, the tension in the wood just binding a little bit, but it's gone on pretty well. A little bit of burning here and there, uh, but not, not an awful lot. I mean, look at those cuts. They're really, really quite nice and clean, so I'm pretty much happy with that. And what I really love is just by putting these on a flat surface and pushing them down, because wood does twist a bit, obviously, when you release the tension. They're all the same size. They're all exactly the same size, so that's completely consistent in terms of the quality of the cut and repeatability of the cut. Really happy. So in terms of size, we were heading for around about 32, so I've set the calipers at zero, and we'll just see what we've got here. 32.2. 32.28, 32.29, 32.16, 32 32.4, 32.4. So that's not too bad. Everything's got 32 in the number at least. We say we set that for 32. And I didn't check that. I just set it for 32 on the gauge that we calibrated last time and went for it. So to be coming out somewhere around about 32.1 to 32.4 is not bad. You know, 0.4 millimeter tolerance out of the box. I, I can live with that. So the next part of my job that you're obviously not interested in, I'm going to glue all these up into some sort of gorgeous pattern. So I'll get that job done now, let it all dry, then we'll come back together and we'll look at how we're going to do those cross cuts on this board. See you in a minute. So our board is now all glued up. It's obviously out of the clamps and I've used the drum sander to bring it down to about 27.3 millimetres. And that drum sander is excellent, and so look out for a future video series looking at that drum sander. It's a Laguna 1632 I bought in case you're interested. But back to the table saw. So we've now ended up with a very, very long edge grain cutting board. What I now need to do is to chop this into 50 millimeter strips right across the board. Then each 50 millimeter strip is put on its edge, exposing the end grain, glued together, hey presto, end grain cutting board. I now need to go to the table saw, the one that we're reviewing, and chunkerize this into 50 millimeter wide strips. Now straight away you can start to see the limitations of the compact table saw. Those limitations are, well, it's compact. So if I'm trying to cut this at 50 millimeters, there's no table surface, and you can see that's gonna be stupid to try and make that cut with a high speed spinning blade. Now the other challenge that I've got is that the running area on this side, the feed-in to the blade itself, is incredibly narrow. This is going to be tipping on the edge of this table. So if I'm not careful, on this as is, I'm going to be fighting this and fighting this whilst pushing it over a spinning blade. And I don't know about you, but I can see that ending in one thing and one thing only. And trust me, it would not be an end grain cutting board. It's probably a loss of limb. So we're going to have to find a way of adapting the table saw in our small workshop to allow for these bigger cuts. The obvious way of doing that is with some sort of cross-cut sled. Now, I've not really gone to town and took my time on making this sled. I literally threw it together in about 10 or 15 minutes. Got a chunk of 18 millimeter MDF knocking around the shop. I milled down some uh, pine stock and just bolted it on that end. And on the bottom, I just had some cherry left over from making the, the cutting board. 
that I just cut down to size to run into the T grooves on the table saw. Screwed those into place. And then just push the sled through the blade to make the cut. I didn't bring the cut all the way through, I stopped short. Put another piece of milled flat stock pine on this end. Screw in one point, then just use a simple set square to position that up so it was square to the blade. And it's not 100% square, I didn't bother calibrating that, it was near enough. And it's actually about 90.04 degrees on my digital calipers. Not precise, but good enough for what we're going to do. Now this 100% changes the functionality of this table saw, because now I've got something that gives me a lot of support and a lot of surface area and solves that problem of the feeding. I measured it up against the fence, so it, as long as it's resting against the fence, with the fence tight up against the board, everything stays nice and square for me, so I'm not fighting anything there, which is great. And I've got all this now leading area to the blade, which is more than enough for the board. I do want to support the board when it's hanging off, because with the weight on, you can see it will have a tendency of tipping. So I'm just putting a roller stand at the back there, just to take that weight and stop that tipping. Just raise the blade to about 30 millimetres or so, so clearings of the board. And I've just positioned the roller clamp at the back, and that now gives me a healthy feed in. I'm then just going to use another roller here to support the board off to the side. So with that roller in place, my material is now completely supported throughout the cut, which means all I need to do now is just to drive the thing backwards and forwards, which is beautiful. So I'll start by just doing a trim on this edge here, just to square it off where those boards don't line up. Then I'm going to put a stop block on here, round about 51 millimetres, 51, 52 millimetres. The reason I'm going slightly oversized for the 50 millimetre board, to give you some room to sand it down to make it all nice and flat and gorgeous. So that's what we'll do. Let's try the first cross cut on this device. Now this has still got the factory fitted blade inside it, and I also want to check the quality of this cut as it's going across the grain. Two types of wood here, a hard maple and a softer cherry. So that should be a really good test for the quality of that blade. Now I do actually have a, an aftermarket blade and key blades and fixings, no association at all to the Woodcrafter, another UK company. And I use these blades quite a lot in the workshop and other tools, so there's no reason to believe this one wouldn't be a good one for the table saw as well. But before we rush into that, I want to try the factory fitted blade and see what sort of cut it gives me on that cross cut. Now straight away it's made a lovely cut, see the back there, a little bit of tear out, a little bit of tear out here on the cherry, a little bit here on the maple, but overall pretty good. Zero tear out on the top and a nice quality end grain cut. Pretty pleased with that I think. I am going to change the blade because I say there's a slight bit of tear out in that that I don't particularly... Uh, want or need, so let me just get rid of that. Perfect fit, so I've gone for 24 teeth to a 50 whatever it was teeth blade, 52 teeth, the same size 210 millimeters, it's got the same arbor in the middle of 30 millimeters and it's 2.4 millimeters kerf, so it's exactly the same like for like replacement which is groovy. And so what I'm hoping to do with this blade, this aftermarket blade, is to get a higher quality cabinet grade cut on that board. Throw it back in this appalling guard. There you go, that spring's back in it again. Can't like that at all, you know. Definitely a new uh, guard coming on. Now to be fair to this blade, it's trying to be all things to all people, so it's trying to be a rip cut blade and a cross cut blade, and it does a good job to be honest with you, but I just don't want that to tear out on my cut, so that's why we're changing this. And I want to set a stop block up. The great thing about cross cut sleds, apart from supporting material in all ways and taking the weight we've got here, so it's a very, very safe way of working, and also all these zero clearance 
cuts you've made do support the material and reduce things like tear out. But you also know where the blades are going to cut. It's going to cut at the edge here that I've made on my sled. So now I'm going to come in with the stop block we just made and I'm going to measure 52 millimeters from this edge. The edge is on this side of the blade because this is a piece that I want to keep. So in with my steel rule and in fact I'll probably give myself 54. I'm going to give myself some room to work here. Can I bring in my little stop block? Bring it up to that mark. So obviously a very low tech solution, but hey, it works and it's safe, which is what we like. So now I can go ahead and I can rip this board down. So now I just simply work down the board and see where we get to. Let's give it a go. And there you go, a whole number of blocks, all cross cut, 50 millimeters. I think the quality of the cut speaks for itself. No tear out whatsoever with that blade. I think it's fair to say that the dust collection is not the best. I was covered in dust. Nice big dust pile down here. Bearing in mind I didn't have the top dust collection on that. It's one of the downsides of a, a sled. Unless you organise something you don't really have top dust collection. So all the dust is flicking back. Uh, into you, but even so there wasn't an awful lot pulled out from the bottom of the machine and it, this is where most of the sawdust has gone to. So now in theory, if my maths and layout and thinking is correct, this should give me a rather nice checkered pattern. Real test for your tools, this sort of cutting board where you've got checks inside it, because if your tools have been out anywhere, anywhere, then these nice lines don't sort of kind of line up so it's one of those things that is a, a gamble if your tools are not accurate so great test for this right now the first thing I'll say is that's pretty good it's pretty big <laughs> and there you go what do you think I think everything seems to line up pretty well. I've got this one piece here that's misbehaving. Don't like that piece. I'm going to drop that one out and try this piece instead. Yeah, it's better. So I've not lined it all up perfectly yet, but you can see how that's working. I think that looks really quite nice. Now it needs gluing up. Uh, everything into place, so there should be zero gaps. Then I need to sand it down a couple of times to bring it down to its final final thickness get some oil on it and that thing should be beautiful so i'm going to go and do that and then we'll come back together once i've got all that done got it sanded got it oiled and then we'll look at the finished results and then we'll do the final wrap up and review of the table saw that we used pretty much to make this board see you in a minute so there you go our review comes to an end before we look at the table saw itself let's look at the product it created. Our test product was the end grain cutting board. I'll just wipe some water on this and you can start to see what that looks like. Once well, it's got the wax on it, it gives you a really good idea. And what I want you to look at is the, the quality of that. Now all the lines are running through parallel all the way through. Really, really nice. A little bit out just here, there's a bit of a slight wobble in that line of cherry there, which shows I had a slight inaccuracy somewhere in the setup on the machine. The joints are as tight as you like, that's going to last um, a lifetime, and that's not just on the front, that's all the way through the board. So that really shows the quality of the cuts we're getting out of the machine overall. So I'm really pleased with that. I've not oiled it just yet because I've actually decided I'm going to carve into this. I'm going to do a little bit of inlay work. I've been practicing inlay on the CNC router on an off cut of this. You can sort of see the effect I'm going for. That's uh, inlaid with a bit of mahogany, I think it is, onto an off cut of this cutting board. So I'm going to put the customer's name across here and when their kitchen was was opened for business, so to speak, a new kitchen fitted. Um, so there's some nice ornate carving on that that I've been practicing on the CNC machine, which is a totally different conversation. But the results speak for itself. I have a high quality board, 
everything was ripped down, cross cut, cut to size on this table saw. And that's worked incredibly well. Okay, so let's look about the pros and the cons. I love this fence. This fence is rock solid. It doesn't move at all in use. It's repeatable. It's super parallel to the blade. It's super parallel to the T-slots. Fantastic. The calibration gauge here, the measuring stick that's on it, is good enough. We were 0 0.2, 0 0.4 millimeters out when we put that in use, and it was consistent, repeatable, consistent cuts, which is what we need from this. Height adjustment with rack and pinion, smooth as you like. Doesn't fluctuate at all. It's set, it's set, works well. The calibration of the angle was good when we got it calibrated in. It wasn't right out of the box, but we quickly got it there with some very, very simple adjustments, and that was repeatable, all looking good. Dust collection when you're using the top rivalry night setup is actually pretty good. When you're collecting dust from the top and dust from the back here, that worked really, really well. Quick change on the rivalry night, I think is one of the best design solutions I've ever, ever seen. Really, really quick, really easy. And a few of you got in touch with me with rivalry knife replacements. Envy is what I will call that. Feeling that you had if you had the older version of this because it's really been upgraded. Couple of negatives, I don't like this yellow insert plate, this throat plate, and a lot of you got in touch saying you don't like that either. In fact, many of you have scrapped that and put in place a, um, a wooden, a hardwood replacement with a zero clearance cut insert inside there, which is something I probably will do as well. It's very, very picky. I would have liked to have seen a ratchet on the blade adjustment rather than that sliding handle, makes it a bit hard to dial it in. A ratchet would have made that easy, but hey, this is the price point that we're working to. It's as noisy as you like. Um, what are we up to? 80 to 90 decibels. It's really going to hurt your ears and annoy your neighbours on a Sunday afternoon if you're a hobbyist woodworker. And without the top guard included, the dust collection is absolutely abysmal and shocking. I like the way everything stores away on this. So there's places to store the mitre gauge and this riving knife. No place to store an additional blade, which is sad, but hey ho, you can't have everything, I guess. Aftermarket blades, easy to get hold of. You're gonna pick these up pretty much anywhere. Any of your local hardware stores, a screw fix, tool station, all those sort of places are gonna stop blades that will fit into this, so you're never gonna be without that. Now, a number of you have also got in touch with me complaining that on yours, the tabletop isn't actually flat. And I did quickly touch on this, I think, in one of the earlier episodes. I think I did, but I'm getting old, so I may have forgotten. But let me just go through that again. My top on this is perfectly flat. And I'm gonna use the light trick uh, to show you what I mean. So I've just knocked the lights off in the workshop and hopefully you can see me. I'll just turn my torch on. You can see my torch, uh, hopefully, shining on, on the tabletop there. Just picking it up. If I come with a straight edge and just rest that on the tabletop, you should be able to see in the T-slots there, the light shining through. But look what happens when I run the light down the ruler, a little bit shining through there as you get to the slot expected, but nowhere else am I getting any light bleeding at all through that straight edge. And that's showing me that this is incredibly flat. And no matter which direction, which plane I check that table in, I'm getting the same result. So I'm not sure whether the moulding of this has changed, whether it's been improved, or I'm incredibly lucky, but this is dead flat, dead, dead, dead flat, you know, not even squilly metres out of calibration. So if you've got something that's different and it's a new machine, then yeah, get back in touch with the manufacturers if you think it's gonna be a problem. So the big question, am I gonna keep this baby in the workshop? And no surprises, yes, yes, I am. Bear in mind, I don't want to use this to give me joinery ready cuts. I want to use this as a tool that quickly gets me close to where I want to be. And then I'll be using things like the drum sander or the quality blade on the Capex to bring me down to a joinery ready point of view. So for that get close, that second touch of material on a, on a power tool, that's perfect for that. I will be modifying it. There will be some pimping going on. The big pimp is going to be the overall cabinet. I will be creating a table cabinet. The cabinet will be the width of my bench, so it will extend this part of the table and this part of the table. There'll be fold down flaps on it that I can quickly come up to extend that capacity even further. And there'll be a fold down flap at the front here that will also come up to extend the infeed. I will be getting a quality sled for this as well. And I've got my eyes on the Incra Extreme cross cutting sled. So that could well be coming along to this too.
I will be running the big air extractor I've got, collector system, to this part of the workshop and I'll pipe this in permanently using that 100mm dust port. A number of you have told me that you're getting great results from that. And then the final thing is when I build a cabinet, these hard plastic feet will rest on to a rubber mat, just reduce that vibration down a little bit and that should help with the noise reduction. But that's it, I'm not really gonna do much else from that. It'll be a permanent member of the shop, it's robust, it's solid, it'll be a hell of a workhorse, great addition, really pleased I bought it for less than 500 quid, including delivery and including an aftermarket blade that we saw the quality of. The results speak for themselves. Hope you found this useful, any questions, drop them in, I'll try to answer where I can and I'll see you next time on The Woodcrafter. <laughs>